here we have another staggering crop of oats and vetches. It's been wilted for a couple of days and we're now cutting it for silage for the cattle. I would think we've got a crop here of in excess of 20 tonnes to the acre. This has been grown without any fertiliser, no herbicides, nothing. It's just purely the work of nature itself. Regenerative farming is all about building natural fertility in the ground. We give nature a chance and as a result nature rewards us. Because we don't use any sort of artificial chemicals, the fungi in the soils are naturally breaking down the roots, the manures and making a fertile medium to grow excellent crops. That's what it's all about. All farms have to reduce their carbon footprint and this is a very effective way of doing it because we're locking up a lot of carbon in the ground. Better get out of the way. It does take some believing, doesn't it? You know, you tell people they don't believe you. My name's Henry Edmonds. I've lived at Childerton all my life, and I started farming here 45 years ago when my father died. The farm here is about a thousand hectares. Some is farmed by my wife, who has the beef suckler herd, and uh, she also rears dairy heifers. And the rest of it is uh, about 400 acres of arable, barley, and oats. Uh, we don't grow any wheat and otherwise about a thousand acres of grassland and of course the whole process revolves around a livestock enterprise so we have dairy cows beef cattle and sheep here we are woolly fields <laughs> so they graze these pastures they put manure on them and the net result is that we're making the land more and more fertile and more and more productive. Over the years, I have struggled to find a system that worked for us. We've got very thin chalk soils, and I soon discovered that if you try to take crop after crop, the soil became really poor, and in fact, we got really bad results. I remember coming back from college, and I thought I'd been taught everything, so I knew that if you had a sterile field, you put 300 weight of ammonium nitrate on and 200 weight of compound fertilizer, and you would get two tons of barley to the acre, as simple as that. Well, I tried that, and uh, in the first year, I achieved a yield of 1,200 weight to the acre, which was a complete disaster. So I realized things had to change, so I then started using long-term pastures. And by doing this, I was able to build the fertility. So now, today, extraordinarily, we can achieve a crop of two tons to the acre with very little difficulty, without the use of any fertilizer whatsoever. Here we've got a crop of rye. And that's only because I've looked after the soils by using animal manures and long-term pasture. This is winter rye. See, it's looking fantastic. This was sown in last October. You can see the height of the crop from here. Th this follows a crop of oats and vetches. That has obviously put nutrients into the ground. We have given this a dressing of, of compost. We've then ploughed it, drilled the rye, shut the gate, that's it. This will all go for milling specialist market. This is the final crop in the rotation and this will then be put down into the long-term pasture which will then continue to build the fertility and then in however many years it is we will plough that 
and to carry on with the arable cycle. When I say long-term pasture, I mean far more than the usual ryegrass mix. I carried on using fertilizers until about 24 years ago. At that point, I started incorporating long-term grass mixtures into my rotations and basically built upon that, I used more legumes. Now, th this is a crop of uh, common sand foin. This has been grown here since 1730 and it's superbly adapted to growing on these light chalk soils. The sand foin is leguminous so it's taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere, nitrogen gas, and converting it into a nitrate which is dissipated into the soil but then it is taken up by the companion grasses. What we've got here is a complex mixture it's dominated by sand foin, but there's also white clover, coxfoot, timothy, meadow fescue, and various other herbs and grasses. So this is why we've got such an astonishing growth of material here, because the grasses are utilizing the nitrate that the sand foin is making. So we don't need to put any artificial nitrogen on the crop. In terms of cattle and sheep feed, you've got really high quality feed here. Lambs, for example, grow faster on sand foin than any other forage crop that can be grown in this country. And later on in the season, after we've taken this for hay, it'll provide very diversified grazing for the animals. And in the meantime, providing lots of nectar for our local bee colonies. Recently, some work's been done on sand foin at London University and they've discovered that the flowers are very rich in caffeine and caffeine it protects the bees against the diseases that they're very prone to today. So I, it, this is of major importance for the future of honeybees throughout the country. More sand foin would help protect our bees. Animals, generally, are absolutely vital to this system. We've got to have livestock to graze down these leguminous crops. We can make silage from crops like oats and vetches, the sand foin and loose sand, they're all turned into silage or hay. Right. By doing that, we're efficiently growing meat and milk from the grasses and the pastures that we are cultivating. Come on, girls, come on. I mean, that's absolutely key. Come on, then. Good boy. It's the only efficient way of, of doing the job and also, of course, we're generating lots of manure that can then be put on Morning. the pastures and Morning. on the cereal crops that follow. <laughs> Come on! With cattle, Morning. we've probably got about 200 dairy cows That's and good about girls. 100 other cows go. which are currently suckling That's calves. When the dairy cow has a calf, we rear the calf. So that means in the system at any one time, we have altogether got about 850 head of cattle. There's the road. Come on, and I'll come back. When we look at methane coming from cattle, of course, if you keep cattle in an industrial situation, so they're jammed in together in great big barns, they're kept there all the time, they're fed on concentrates, up, up. some of which would be soya bean meal that's come from the Amazon. A very rich diet. Well, of course, they produce a lot of wind. The situation is completely unnatural. Animals should not be kept in barns. Here, our cattle are grazing on these lays, uh, of which sand foin is a major component. Now, it's been demonstrated quite conclusively that sand foin reduces the methane output from cattle. Besides making them grow more efficiently than they would do being fed with expensive concentrates in barns. Come on then, no more hobnobbing with a bull. Come on, on you go, come on. But at the same time, Get on. by grazing these legumes and with the root of legumes up, up. going into the soil, into the subsoil, we are helping to pull carbon out of the atmosphere 
into the ground where it's being trapped. Come on, beauties, come on. This has to be the way that farming can come actually on, make a, a major That's contribution to come tackling on. climate change. That's it. It's benefits like this that the DEFRA test and trial has been set up to investigate. Yeah, it's a lovely evening out. It's the rain. Lovely swallows working across the crop. Oh, I just watching. love to see the swallows. Yeah. Henry obviously is very well known in the area. And I was asked when this DEFRA test and trial was being put together, we wanted to come out and see what Henry was doing because his fame had gone before him. And I think it was recognised that Henry had so much information that he'd been collecting over the years in you know, all these biological records. Now, this is sand for in here. And no one doubted that they were accurate, but I think it was felt that there needed to be sort of an independent expert witness, if you like, that could come along and verify that. Um, you know, if we look at that, I mean, compared, compared to a conventional crop, we spray to, to the devil, there's a few thistles, and I would say that there's not enough weeds in here to affect the yield of the crop. And when did this go in? This went in in uh, March. And then after we sowed the crop, then it was uh, undersown with a grass mixture. If you try and grow grass seed just in a bare piece of ground without a cover crop, that's very difficult to establish mm -hmm. because you'll get a mass of annual weeds that will just smother it out. But under the barley, no, the barley keeps it very clean, mm -hmm. but the grass seed can come up. So, I mean, even on the edge of the field here, you can see all the legumes are coming yeah. up here. And it's this legume mix that's, that's it. really it's yeah. sort of linchpin of your whole system, it. isn't it? And without that, it wouldn't really work? No, no, it wouldn't work. You can see the grass is coming through. Got sandfoin, red clover, lucerne, birdsfoot trefoil. That's a lovely show of how under so works. Isn't Thinking it? about Henry's under sown barley and that's the kind of thing that other farms that they can do I'm that themselves. Easy. So we'll, we'll, we'll combine this barley and then of course we'll bale the straw up so the straw will be fed back to the cattle. The straw will have lots of grass and stuff in it so it'll be quite high feed value and then the grass will come up and all these legumes in the stubble and come October, November I'll be grazing this off with the sheep. And slugs? So, Do you have any issues with slugs? Or? Slugs? No, because we've got all these carabid beetles yes. that are coming out of the yeah. field margins. Yeah. They're taking care of yeah. the slugs. Yeah, beneficial predators. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whereas of course on the farms that are using pesticides, they're killing them all. So they have to use slug pellets. I mean, the more control you, you, that you carry out on these so-called pests and all the rest of it, you're actually continually wiping out the beneficial insects yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So you have to do more and more. It's ridiculous. It's a vicious circle, it isn't is. it? It is, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and you, we just need people to be brave enough to get off that treadmill and, and think about different ways. As I'm going around to the various farms in the area, and no one doubts now that actually having a healthy soil is really fundamental to a good farming system and to profit. And people are looking at how they can bring livestock back into their system. They realise that the grass and, and nitrogen fixing plants in these legume bays are just such an important component of building healthy soils. And I think it's really exciting that looking at the new environmental land management schemes, farmers will be able to get paid for putting in legume rich lays. And not only is that building soil fertility, and improving drought resistance, but it's a fantastic biodiversity resource. You know, one of the things that I just love about Downland, it's the smell. Yes, Can you smell yes. it now? It catches you, doesn't it? And this is ex-arable? This was arable, say, 25 years ago. You know, it's taken quite a long time to get to this. I put in a, a sort of proper Downland grass mix, and then I seeded it with seeds that I collected off road verges and such like. Yes. Some nice pyramidal orchids, lovely. yeah. So Some how do you manage it? This one is actually grazed in the winter by ponies and or by sheep. Right. But And then we rest it. I can hear a corn bunting over there, yep. Henry. Yep. <laughs> it's just so bioabundant. Um, and what I, I love is it's not just the rare, you know, there's lots of the common as well. And 
I think in conservation we often get hung up on the rare species conservation and that's actually not where it's at. If we don't have lots of everything, we're in trouble. Yeah, every farm needs areas like this. It it's a refugia for yeah. where wildlife can survive and, and then when conditions get better, it can spread out again. Yeah. The challenge that the Defra Test and Trial team had was how do you actually add a financial value to it all? For a number of years now, we've been talking about the value of biodiversity and we're talking about paying for public goods and biodiversity is one of the public goods. But it's really hard on a farm. How do you actually put a value on, on the wildlife? And so that was really where FTEC came in. We at FTEC, which is Economics for the Environment Consultancy, uh, we use the natural capital approach to, to make the invisible benefits and costs of environmental impacts visible. The natural capital approach considers nature as a stock of assets and it tries to understand the uh, extent and condition of those assets and then understand what benefits flow from those assets. And it really encourages the process of thinking of it as something that you invest in and that you take care of. And if you take care of it, it will continue to deliver benefits in the future. So this particular project has been trying to work out what the economic value of those benefits have been at Chalderton. This is all part of the process of trying to help DEFRA establish what benefits are worth paying for and what level of payment ought to be for public goods. The natural assets on Henry's farm are things like soil, water, minerals, wildlife and the ecological communities. Yeah, look at that lovely crumbly soil there, Duncan. Fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Really? You Very think it's all just grade four land, but look at that, beautiful. It is very crumbly. Masses of roots that will turn into organic matter in the soil over time. And it's a lot richer than the norm. Yeah, it is. And I mean, you can see this is a living soil and we could literally grow any crop we wanted in it. The biggest benefits that we could evaluate here were things like uh, biodiversity, which is truly outstanding. There's the woodland carbon sequestration, there's hedgerow sequestration, and there's carbon sequestration in soils. And so how much soil organic matter do you reckon there is in there? Henry? Well, currently there's about 12%. Looking at the, the test samples that we've taken, and 30 odd years ago, it would have been four to five percent organic matter. Looking at the levels of uh, organic carbon that have been uh, trapped in the soil, on a conventional arable farm, uh, we're looking at figures of probably about 65 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Now here, on an average of several different fields, we were sequestering 140 tonnes per hectare. So it just shows that uh, this system is very effective at building up organic carbon in the soil and hence sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. If an arable farm were to go onto a rotational system such as the one I practice here, they could say within about five years actually double the amount of organic carbon they have within their soils. What do you think the government's going to do under this new scheme to encourage people to build fertility in their soils naturally? We need to start paying for this sort of thing, don't we? And uh, of course, uh, everybody's sharpening their calculators on what they think that's <laughs> going to be worth. Yeah. Sequestering carbon in soils is a great opportunity. The government's got guidance on what they think the value of carbon storage is to meet carbon targets, and they're advising it, and it's only going to go one way. It's likely to go up. But at the moment, 1% of the soil organic matter would probably equate to around one and a half tonnes of carbon dioxide sequestered per hectare per year. So that's going to be, what, anywhere between 100 and 200 pounds per hectare per year. So it's a large sum of money just in the carbon sequestration benefits alone, let alone all the other benefits that go with increased fertility and resilience as well. Another aspect of natural capital that DEFRA are considering rewarding is for biodiversity. Biodiversity is a really big challenge because uh, the, the biodiversity here at Chalderton is so unique. Oh good, here's a, here's a green hair streak. I mean over 40 species of different butterfly have been measured here and 
740 species of moth and it's difficult to put uh, a value on something quite that unique but we can say if you wanted to recreate something similar to this in another location it would cost at least 100 million if you tried to use something like the DEFRA biodiversity net gain system so 100 million is a huge value for the biodiversity of this particular farm alone. And that just seems absolutely huge and you think well how, how, how can it actually come to that? But then actually when you think about all the things that that biodiversity is, is doing, you know, it's producing food. Carbon sequestration. It's helping to provide clean air, clean water. Recreation that the public enjoys through walking over the land. It just all begins to stack up and when you start to value all of those different aspects of what the biodiversity and Henry's system is delivering, then you think, well, actually, maybe, maybe that's not that much, really, for what it's delivering. Henry's farm is truly exceptional. What he's shown is that it's possible to use natural means to build the resilience of your soils and take care of them. I, I feel very strongly uh, that, that uh, th this is the right way forward and a lot of the reason is because I believe that we shouldn't trash nature. I like to see wildlife everywhere and I, I know that under a mixed farming system like this nature flourishes. Actually looking after nature costs and so that's why I think this test and trial has been really important in getting the ball rolling. Farming itself doesn't make much money, but Henry's producing all of these other benefits for free. And, and hopefully, out of this, we'll be able to develop something that can be applied across farms because it's going to become increasingly important. Um, you know, whether farms are really looking at making it, you know, the, the big level of change that Henry's made here or whether they're looking at perhaps some of their more marginal land and how that could be used differently. I think this is where just being able to, to value nature is so important. I think a lot of farms do want to do the right thing but it's difficult making ends meet and so we need to create a new system that actually incentivises farmers to do the right things and I mean, Henry's approach for doing it naturally proves it can be done. Climate change is a topic that is on everyone's lips and you see what the NFU are wanting to do with regards to climate change and when we look at the farmed landscape and just the area of the United Kingdom that it covers, what a prime opportunity farmers have to actually really make a difference. And when I come out to somewhere like this, it, uh, I mean I think I'm an optimist actually and I think we need to be we really do still have a chance to make a change. We're almost at the point, I believe, where it's too late. But I believe if people really do take the bull by the horns and they're prepared to make some big changes, and, and if government's prepared to actually invest in that, you know, that's so important, then it's not too late. Today, climate change hangs over us like an impending catastrophe. We can't just keep asking what everyone else can do about it. We have to think, what can we as farmers do? By adopting regenerative practices, we farmers can make a tremendous difference. <laughs>